So we've looked at the uh, contour of the spine when we're standing and we did a visual inspection. Now we're moving on to palpation. And when we're palpating, we're trying to get information through our fingers. And in order to do that, we need to make sure that we're not pressing too hard. So if I press gently with my thumb on my fingertips, then the touch sensors of the fingers are much more acute in terms of their feeling than the pressure sensors. If I push really deeply, I tend to disguise some of my feeling because I'm feeling with the pressure sensors. So initially, it's a light touch and you have to be cautious because some patients are, are, are quite ticklish, so it can't be too light, but a light touch which allows me to get some information. Once I think I'm over the area that I want to feel, so for example, if I'm over a spinous process, then I can press in more deeply. I'm getting a little bit more information um, about the contour of the spinous process as I'm moving my thumbs up and down and around the spinous process itself. So fingertips initially for light palpation to get an overall view of what's beneath the skin and then fingers and thumb pressure to get an idea of the contour of the bone itself. And at the moment, remember, we're palpating. If we were to perform manual therapy, where once we've found the area, we simply want to create force, then we've got other considerations. So rather than using thumbs and fingers, we might use the pisiform, we might use the elbow. But for palpation, it's strictly our hands and the surface. So when I'm assessing for warmth, I can use the palm of my hand or the back part of my hand. As I'm coming in for accuracy, I want to use my thumb and my fingertips. So let's have a look at a slightly closer view looking at spinal palpation. So when we're palpating the spine, we are looking at the bony landmarks that we described in standing. But of course, when we're looking and doing a visual inspection, there's a limit to what we can see, whereas with palpation, we can get more information. So if we just have a look at the spine, first thing we need to do is to find the iliac crests. And from there, we can then go in towards the sacrum itself. So taking my flat hand and I'm pulling it down onto the iliac crest itself. And at that level, I'm looking to see whether my hands are equal. Now, if I stand here, I won't see this, but if I draw my head over the center of the spine, it becomes easier. So at that level, if I take a straight line across, I should finish approximately at L4, the fourth lumbar vertebra. As I come from here, my, my fingers naturally fall into a hollow, and that is the dimple of Venus, and the posterior superior iliac spine lies close to that level. So if we look on the skeleton, my thumbs are here. So what I would have to do to palpate the posterior superior iliac spine is to slide downwards and then move up. That way I get directly over the sharpest point. So thumbs in the dimple come down and then push in and up and you, and you find a sharp little beak of bone and that is the posterior superior iliac spine, the PSIS. And if we look from the skeleton, as we come across from there, we're approximately at the S2 level. So we come down here, and if I drift my thumb medially, I should find a little hollow. And sometimes it'll be between S1 and S2, and sometimes it'll be directly in. So as I'm pressing here, I'm having to go down slightly, and that brings me to my S2. So on the skeleton, I've got the posterior superior iliac spine. I've come medially and down slightly.
And as we can see, under that area, we've got the sacroiliac joint. So if we find the posterior superior iliac spine, we know that the sacroiliac joint is about three, two to three centimeters wide, and it's as much above as is below my thumb. So in other words, a line obliquely drawn. And if I come down into the sacrum, we can see the sacral foramina, the four holes where the nerve roots issue. And those are approximately a relaxed hand width apart. So if I find the posterior superior iliac spine, relax my hand and place it upon the patient, I can say that that's approximately S1, S2, S3, S4. So all I've done is to place my hand on here and to count down. So, so far then, we've had the iliac crests, looking at symmetry in terms of their height, drawing a line across to find L4, sinking the thumbs down into the dimple to represent the width of the sacrum, and as a little check there, the sacrum is about one third of the width of the pelvis. So if I palpate here onto the rim of the pelvis, then my sacrum, my thumbs which illustrate the width of the sacrum should be about a third of that width, which they are. Once I found that dimple, I came down and then I pressed upwards and that was my posterior superior iliac spine. Now, when I place my thumbs onto the spinous processes of the sacrum, I can run my thumb along and then because the sacrum is angled, the first hollow that I get into will cause me to end up at the L5 spinous process. So if you place your thumb onto the sacrum, sink down, 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 and then the first hollow is this part which is the lumbosacral junction. The first beak of bone in the centre is L5 and then L4 we said find the iliac crest and come across. So this is my lumbar spine then, my lumbar lordosis and we're looking to see the depth of the lumbar lordosis. So if you've got an anterior tilted pelvis and an increased depth of the lordosis, then the lordosis will be deeper. Equally, can you see a curve throughout the whole of the lumbar spine as we can on this subject? Or can you see um, hinging where you see a curve restricted to a smaller area? So in the center then, we've got our spinous processes. So I'm placing my thumb onto the most superficial bony prominence, and then between the spinous processes, I have my interspinous ligament. So I've got a spinous process here, pressing in, and then I feel that mound of bone, and then a hollow. And that hollow as I'm pressing, is the interspinous space, so between the spinous processes. As I come out, I'm onto the facet joint, approximately one finger width from the centre of the spine. So I'm coming out onto the ridge, and that ridge is my the first part of my spinal extensors, uh, the longissimus portion of the erector spinae and where I feel that bony prominence, that would be my facet joint. And if we look on the spine itself, you can see that as I palpate onto the spinous process and come down and out, I get to the facet joint. So it's not directly out. So once I'm on my spinous process, if I go down and out by one finger width, that takes me to the facet joint. When I'm on the spinous process, if I go directly to the side by two finger widths, that takes me to the edge of the transverse process. So we've got the transverse process level with the spinous process. We've got the facet joint 
coming between the spinous processes because remember the facet joint is formed of the um, one of the faces of the joint above and one of the faces of the joint below. So we've got our lumbar vertebrae and we can count all the way up our lumbar vertebra. And the lumbar vertebrae in the center, L2 to L4, are, are all similar. But as we come down, L5 is a lumbar vertebra because it has its junction with L4, but it also makes a joint with the sacrum. So it is slightly different. So at the lumbar sacral junction, the movement will be slightly different. And as we come further up, as I get to L1, it will make its junction with the thoracic spine. So because the facet joints are differently angled throughout the regions of the spine, as we saw on the PowerPoint presentation, when we get the junction between L1 and T12, that motion is slightly different. So we come on to T12, and as a, an approximate check, when the arm is down by the sides, and we can palpate the uh, inferior angle of the scapula, if we find the iliac crest approximately halfway, that takes us to T12. As we come further up the spine, the inferior angle of the scapula is approximately at T7. The root of the spine of the scapula is approximately at T3. And then as we come up into our cervical spine, remember that the first cervical spine vertebra, which is C1, or the atlas bone doesn't have a spinous process. So it has a little nub of bone. So when we come from this area, which is the occipital protuberance, the external occipital protuberance, and we slide down, we end up in a hollow. So that is C1, the spinous process of atlas. The first spinous process that we can actively palpate is C2, the axis bone. So we can palpate several different bony areas here then. So we've had L5, which was the dip coming off the sacrum, L4, which was on a line of the iliac crest, L1, which has a different motion to T12. Between the iliac crest and the lowest part of the sacrum, approximately T12. As we come to the inferior angle of the scapula, approximately T7. The root of the spine of the scapula, approximately T3. So once we're progressing up the spine then, we've got our spinous process coming out by two finger widths, we've got our transverse process. Thumbs on the spinous process come down into the hollow, to the interspinous area, go out by one finger width, and that takes us to our facet joint. And that will be the same all the way up the spine, but of course the neck is considerably narrower than the lumbar spine, so our palpation has to get slightly narrower. So when we're looking at the facet joints in the cervical spine, your fingers will be slightly closer to the other compared to the lumbar spine. And the additional factor that we have in our thoracic spine, of course, is the junction on the ribs. And if you remember, the ribs came in and made that junction with the vertebral body itself, and that was the costo-vertebral joint. And then they made a joint with the transverse process, and that was the costo-transverse joint. So, as we come from the thoracic spine, if we come down between the spinous processes and come out, 
the first rib junction that we find should be at our costovertebral joint. Then we come out to the transverse process and we should be at the level of the costotransverse joint. And then we have a marked area, which is the rib angle. So the rib is, is facing, coming backwards, angles and then goes forwards. And we can get the idea of that rib angle. And then as we come up to our scapula, so far we've had the inferior angle, the lowest point. Then we should be able to see and palpate the medial border. The top part that we see is normally the root of the spine of the scapula. In order to find the superior angle, because the scapula comes up and angles forwards, I need to go in slightly deeper. So this would be the superior angle, this would be the root of the spine of the scapula, and this is our inferior angle. So that's palpation of the spine.